ADO.NET is the .NET Framework's universal technology for working with and connecting to databases. There are two main areas of database connectivity here. There's SQL, which is used for Microsoft SQL Server, and OLEDB, which is used for pretty much everything else. Both of them operate almost identically. The only real differences are in some of the different class names that we're going to be looking at. So if you learn one way, you kind of learn them both. And this makes every single database you can imagine accessible right from within Windows PowerShell. So before we, we dive right into that, let's take a moment and come to the same page on some terminology. Here's Microsoft Access showing a sample database. The file itself, the ACCDB or MDB file, is the database. And within it, you'll find one or more tables, which each have a name. Within each table are columns, which have a column name, and rows, which contain the data for the columns. It's often important to understand the way a database is designed. Again, here in Access, you can see the design by using the Design View mode for a table. Each column has a defined name and a type, such as text, date, time, number, and so forth. The column type is important because it lets you know what kind of data that column can contain. Finally, columns may have additional properties. So this one, for example, is not a required column, meaning you can create new rows in this table without providing a value for this column. Columns may also have a default value or validation rules that constrain the type of data which can go into the column. There are four basic steps to working with a database. First, you connect to the database. Second, you create a command which contains your database query. That's going to be fired off, processed by the database, and then results are going to come back to you. So step three is to actually execute your query. That's what sends it away. The last step is to read the data that came back from the database and, and do something with it. You might think that the SQL language is associated only with Microsoft SQL Server, but that's not quite true. ADO.NET actually translates the SQL language commands into whatever your database understands, meaning you can use a single, standardized language to communicate with any database. There are four basic commands in the SQL language. Select, which queries data from the database in the form of rows of data, delete, which removes data, insert, which adds data, and update, which changes data in existing database rows. Here's a simple select statement. Select star, or all columns, from the table named computers. As illustrated, this will return all columns and all rows from the specified table. This statement is a bit more specific. It's only selecting a single column from the specified table, although it's still returning every row in the table. Here's one that's even more specific. It's selecting a specific column and only grabbing those rows that meet a specific criteria. In this case, only those rows where the service pack column contains the value 1. Notice that numeric values, like the one shown here, are not enclosed in any kind of quotation mark or any other delimiter. String values are enclosed in single quotation marks. Dates and times are usually enclosed in single quotes, except for access databases, where they're enclosed in pound or hash signs. Okay, last one. This time I'm selecting a specific column and only those rows which meet my criteria. However, I'm returning all the rows in a particular order, sorted by the value in the last update column. I can do that even though I won't actually see the last update column and the results I get back, because that column wasn't included in the select list. The illustration shows the order in which the rows will be returned. This statement will delete all rows from the computers table where the service pack column contains the value too. Typically, delete statements always include a WHERE clause, or else they delete every row from the table. Here's an update query. It's updating the computer's table and changing the service pack column to the value 2 for all rows where the computer name column contains the string value server 5. Here are the single quotation marks that I mentioned earlier, used to enclose string values. Again, they're also used for date and time values for most databases except Microsoft Access. Insert queries are perhaps the trickiest. I'm inserting rows into the computer's table, and I need to specify the column names that I'm providing values for. Then I use the values keyword, followed by the values for those columns. 
the values have to be listed in the same order as the column names in the first list. Notice how the date value is enclosed in single quotes, which again will work for almost anything except Microsoft Access. Finally, notice the positioning of the commas in each list. The commas are used to separate the column names and the column values. The columns go outside any delimiting quotation marks. Both lists are enclosed within parentheses. The illustration shows the new row that is added to the table after this query runs. So we'll get started by loading up the portion of the .NET framework that deals with databases. It's contained in the system.data DLL, so we use reflection.assembly, load with partial name, system.data. This normally returns a success value, which I don't want to see, so I simply pipe the output of that command to out null, suppressing the output. With the database functionality loaded into the shell, it's time to create a connection to our database. You'll use one of two objects. System.data.olaydb.olaydb connection is for most databases. Or the SQL Server specific system.data.sqlclient.sql connection. Both work pretty much the same, and both are created by using the new object commandlet. I'll start by loading the system.data assembly. This is basically the DLL which contains all of the .NET Framework's database functionality. Normally, this load with partial name method will return a success indication, which would kind of mess up my script's output, so I'm piping that indication to out null, which will suppress the method's output. Next, I'll create a new connection object using the new object commandlet and the class name system.data.olaydb.olaydb connection. I'll save the connection object in a variable, $con, to use later. Next, I'll set the connection string property of this connection. Now, I'm using a Microsoft Access 2007 database, which means I have to have access installed on this computer or the connection won't be able to work. To actually open the connection, we'll use the connections object's open method. That has to be combined with a connection string for the database. The connection string tells the shell where the database is physically located, what kind of database it is, how to log in if credentials are required, and so forth. I use the free website www.connectionstrings.com to find examples of connection strings, or I use the PrimalScript database browser, which provides a graphical user interface that helps create connection strings. Here's an example connection string for an Access 2007 database or an Access 2000, 2002, or 2003 database. Note that you actually have to have Access installed on the same computer as PowerShell in order for these to work. You modify the data source portion of the string to indicate the location of your access database file. Now I'm ready to open the connection to the database by executing the open method. Again, this returns some output, so I'm piping it to out null to suppress that output. With the connection open, we'll need to create a command. Its job is to contain our SQL query and to provide a means of executing the query and accessing the results. As with the connection, you'll choose between a fairly generic olaydb command or a SQL Server specific SQL command. Once you create the new command using new object, you set its connection property to be equal to your opened connection object. That way the command knows what connection to use. You then put your SQL language query into the command text property and you're ready to execute the command. So a command lets me send instructions to my database. I'll create a new command by using the new object commandlet and the class name system.data.olaydb .olaydb command. I'm saving the connection object in a variable, $cmd, for later use. I need to set the command's connection property to my open connection object so that the command knows what database connection to use. Finally, I'll tell the command what SQL query to execute by setting its command text property to a valid SQL query string. If your SQL query is a select query, then you're expecting to get results back. So you execute the query by using the commands execute reader method. This returns a data reader object which contains your results. For delete, insert, and update queries, which do not return results, you execute the query by using the execute non-query method. It doesn't return an object, it just executes your query. So I'm ready to execute my command. Because I'm executing a select query, I'm expecting output back. Therefore, I use the commands execute reader method. This returns a data reader object, which I save in the variable $reader. 
Had I executed any other type of query, I wouldn't have expected results back, and so I would have used the commands execute non-query method instead. If you executed a select query using the execute reader method of your command, then you get back a data reader object. This object contains all the rows your query returned, and it uses a sort of pointer to keep track of which row you're working with. You can only work with one row at a time, and you move the pointer to the next row in order to move through the entire set of rows. The read method of the data reader object moves the pointer to the next row, and it also returns true if there are additional rows still waiting to be read. You can also look at the has rows property to see if your query returned any rows or not. So once you're on a row within your data reader, you'll want to get the information out of the columns. To do so, you need to know the column's ordinal or index number, not its name. To find the ordinal number, use the data reader's get ordinal method, giving it a column name. That will tell you the ordinal for that column. Then use the get value method giving it the column ordinal number, and you'll get back the value from that column for the current row. Note that, as its name implies, a data reader can only be used to read data. You cannot change data using it. To change data, you'll need to execute an update query. Your data reader is also static. If changes occur to the database after your data reader is obtained, it will not reflect those changes. To get an updated set of rows, you would need to execute your original command again and get a new data reader. So with my reader object retrieved, I can execute its read method to move to the first row of data. I use the getValue method to retrieve the contents of a column on the current row. Because getValue expects a column index number rather than a name, I'm using the reader object's getOrdinal method to retrieve that index number for the column name I want. I then execute the read method again. Notice that it returns true, indicating that there's still more data here to be read. I continue doing this over and over until the read method returns false, indicating I've reached the end of the table. At that point, I can close the reader by calling its close method. I should also close the database connection when I'm done, so that I don't leave the connection hanging open. Note that a data reader ties up your connection object. So long as you have a data reader open, you can't perform other queries with your connection. If you need to read and update data at the same time, use two connection objects, one to read the data and the other to execute update queries. When you're done using a reader, its close method will free up the connection. And be sure to use the connection object's close method when you're done, so that you're not holding open resources on the database. So let's see the entire set of database objects come together for a practical task. Here I have an access database, which has a table named computers. Within that table is a column named computer name, and it contains computer names that I want to query. Here in my script, I start by defining a connection string that points to my database file. I load the system.dataAssembly, and then create an OLADB connection. I set its connection string property equal to my connection string, and then call its open method to open the connection. Next, I create a command object. Set its connection equal to the open connection object, and set its command text equal to a query. I execute the command and get a data reader object. I'm using a while construct to continue reading data until the read method returns false. Each time through the loop, the read method will also advance to the next row of data. Within the loop, I'm getting the contents of the computer name variable column for the current row and storing that in the dollar sign computer variable. Then I'm executing get WMI object retrieving the Win32 operating system class from the specified computer and outputting its CS name, build number, and service pack major version properties. When I've finished, I close both my reader and my connection. The result is a set of topics listing computer names, their Windows build number, and their service pack version. It would be possible to save that information back to my database, but I'd need to open a second connection object. That would be used to execute update queries to update the table with whatever information I wanted. That's something you can try. Pause this video and take some time to complete this lab. Use the lab guide included on this disk to guide you through the lab tasks. When you're finished, resume this video and I'll present a sample solution. You'll also find hints and solutions right in your lab guide.
My solution for lab 1-1 is just an expansion of the last example I showed you. I've added a test ping function to ping computers before trying to connect to them with WMI. This function will return a true or a false, and if it returns false, I don't even want to try the WMI connection. I've changed the name of my connection object variable to readcon, and I've created a second connection using the same connection string called writecon. I'll use one connection to read from the database and the other connection to update the database. I've opened both connections to get started. I'm defining a SQL query in a string variable. I usually do that so that it's easier to output my query using write debug if I need to debug the query. Notice that my query is only selecting one column from the table. Here's the database in Microsoft Access, and you can see that there are other columns available to me. Back in my script, I'm creating a new command object, setting it to use my read connection, and giving it my SQL query. Then I execute the command, getting a reader object back. I'm once again using a while loop to loop through rows of data, allowing the reader's read method to advance to the next row and tell me if there are any more. I'm getting the computer name from the reader, and then using my test ping function to see if the computer responds to a ping. If it does not, I set the spver variable to unreachable. If the computer does respond, I use WMI to query its Win32 operating system class and set the spver variable equal to the service pack major version property. If you pay attention, you'll notice that the spver variable is populated either way, whether the computer is reachable or not. Next, I'm constructing a SQL query to update my database. I'm updating the SP inventory table and setting the SP version column equal to whatever's in my SP ver variable for whatever table row contains my computer's name in the computer name column. So this updates only a single row at a time. I create a new command object. I can't use my old one, remember, because that's connected to my database reading connection. The new command object uses my database writing connection, gets my query, and I call the execute non-query method since I'm not ex expecting a result back from this. The method does return a success or failure indicator, which I'm piping to out null so that it doesn't mess up my script's output. When I'm done, I close both my reader and my writer connections.